Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to start by singing America the Beautiful two verses. You will see the words up on these big screens. So if we could all stand and join in singing together. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the American Enterprise Institute's annual gala. I'm Arthur Brooks, president of AEI. On behalf of our trustees, our board of academic advisors, our 200 scholars and staff, we are honored to share this evening with you tonight. Our annual gala is always a special evening. It's time to honor the great work that our scholars and fellows have done over the past year it's a time to enjoy the company of friends and colleagues in this incredibly beautiful setting. And most importantly, it's the occasion on which we present the Irving Crystal Award, AEI's highest honor. But tonight is a particularly special one for us at AEI because tonight we celebrate AEI's 75th anniversary. <clears throat> This is a signal milestone for AEI. It means we've fought for free enterprise and American greatness for almost a third of the Republic's history. As we pause to reflect on the first 75 years, we also rededicate ourselves to the timeless principles and our enduring cause. Maximizing liberty, increasing individual opportunity, strengthening free enterprise and American leadership. These aren't just our values as an institute. They're the bedrock of the American project. They're why America remains a beacon to the world. We believe in these principles because we believe in the idea and the ideal of America, and because we know that free enterprise creates unmatched opportunities for human flourishing, and that American leadership is an act of global brotherhood. We also know that these principles urgently need defenders. Defenders who can explain why freedom, opportunity, and enterprise not only make us better off, but they make us better people. People willing and able to share the prosperity and opportunity with those who need it most here and around the world. There are many in our country today who fear that America's best days are behind us, that we're fading into just another giant social democracy. But I look out over the faces in this room that men and women utterly committed to limited government, but an unlimited America, and I feel confident about our nation's future. At the American Enterprise Institute, we see ourselves as conservators of a tradition, building on the wisdom of our intellectual forefathers and strengthening that which is best in our country. With every generation, AEI cultivates and develops what has come before, seeking to improve our great American institutions. Now, we realize that even the greatest intellectual insights are of scant use without policy entrepreneurs to engage them 
and bring them alive to the public discourse. <clears throat> and we at AEI are deeply grateful, not just to tonight's Irving Crystal Award winner and his colleagues in elective public service, but to so many of you here tonight who have put the fight for freedom, individual opportunity, and free enterprise at the center of your lives and at the center of your careers. At this time, it's my honor, on behalf of AEI's Council of Academic Advisors and the Crystal family, to introduce the winner of this year's Irving Crystal Award. <clears throat> One time, not that long ago, a journalist asked me this question. As president of AEI, you deal with a lot of politicians. Who is the think tankiest of them all? <clears throat> now, by this, I think he meant the ability to dive deeply into policy and not the tendency to have soup on his tie. <clears throat> My reaction was immediate. Congressman Paul Ryan from Wisconsin. Few politicians can master the details of policy like Paul. Furthermore, few can fit the details into a policy message that dignifies the values of America's founders, and it's just extraordinary. That conversation with the journalist got me thinking about the Irving Crystal Award that we present each year, and I nominated Paul to AEI's Council of Academic Advisors. They enthusiastically agreed to give him this award. That was last summer. When I called Paul to tell him, he gladly accepted, but he offhandedly said that it might be a bit complicated by a new turn of events in his life. A week later, Mitt Romney announced that Paul was to be his running mate for vice president. What a year it's been for Paul. I'm really delighted tonight to dedicate an evening in AEI's highest honor to Paul Ryan's service, his ideas, and his future. I can't wait to hear his thoughts. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the winner of the 2013 Irving Crystal Award, Congressman Paul Ryan. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much. This is um, thank you very much. Really an undue honor. Thank you. You know, what do I say? Um, I want to thank Arthur for this, for his remarks. Uh, when he did call me that one day, that's not exactly what I said. I said, I thought you didn't give this thing to politicians. <laughs> um, I want to thank you all for this award. You know, as I look around this room, one phrase just keeps coming through my mind. Think tank prom. <laughs> You all look so lovely. What, what a wonderful evening. And um, it's an honor to be recognized by your peers. It's also a special honor to be recognized for your work. So I hope that this evening I can give you some sustenance, and I can do it in as brief a period of time as possible so you can get on with your meal. I want to say that um, I'm especially grateful because in this particular case, it's an award to be recognized by your peers for your contribution to a cause. It's our common cause. And the cause that we've labored with, the cause of AEI, is the American idea. What is this idea? Well, it's pretty simple. It's the belief that the circumstance of your birth should not determine the outcome of your life. That if you work hard, you play by the rules, you get ahead, you can get ahead and make a difference. As I will explain, this belief is at risk. It's in need of support. And AEI, AEI has given it support. For years, you've taught the country about the American idea, what it means, where it came from, who first spoke of it and why. And one man who gave his all to this effort was the man who we're really honoring tonight, Irving Crystal. 
Irving Kristol was a Renaissance man. He could discuss Rousseau and size up Reagan all while the rest of us tried to catch up with him. He was a perfect blend of book smarts, know-how, in short, he was one of a kind. But you've carried on his work quite well here at AEI. You've continued to defend the American idea. I, too, have come to a number of these dinners. Four years ago, Charles Murray stood here and argued that we should keep our way of life because it's the best way of life. It's the most challenging and the most fulfilling. I was so moved by that lecture that I printed off hard copies and sent it to every one of my staffs, sent it to anybody I could find. Last year, Leon Cass took out the baton. He argued that we should love our country not just because it's our own, but because it's good. It respects every person's dignity. Both men reminded us why we should defend the American idea. But we might lose it. Today, the left runs Washington. They seek to replace the American idea with the progressive state. They want to replace equal opportunity with equal outcomes. First, let me say they're well-intentioned. They're trying to do good as they see it. Hard as it might be to admit, they're speaking to a need, a need for security in a world of growing complexity. So before conservatives can win, we have to understand what it is we're doing wrong. The fact is, we also have to speak to this need. We have to explain how too much government will weaken security and how our agenda will increase security. We have to reclaim the center of our politics. And we can do this. It is not too late. My predecessors on this stage discussed why we should save the American idea. Tonight, I want to discuss how we can save the American idea. It's a big project. It goes way beyond politics. But I will stick to the political side with a due sense of humility in a crowd like this. Here's the Cliff Notes version. Both the left and the right too often split the world into halves, the individual and the government. They forget the key part of life, that part that gives real security. They forget society that space in between. We can save the American idea by saving that space for society. All in all, I hope that I show you the value of a politician's perspective and that after I'm done, you don't take the award back. <laughs> First, let's review where things stand. The left thinks we're in a new era, and for good reason. The health care law is not just another entitlement. It puts one-sixth of our economy in the hands of federal bureaucrats. It allows government to stage manage our lives in the most personal of domains, our health. And now that the Supreme Court has upheld the law, we cannot be sure that it will enforce the Constitution's limits. We can't be sure that government will stay within its boundaries. So how do we get here? The health care law is part of a larger movement called progressivism. It began in the late 19th century. At first, it was a bipartisan affair. The re progressives included Republicans like Teddy Roosevelt and Democrats like Woodrow Wilson. These leaders were skeptical of the Constitution. They disliked the idea of limited government, and you can understand why. At the turn of the 20th century, change was everywhere, from the crowded streets in New York to the plains of Texas. America was becoming more urban, more industrial. Families were leaving the farm for the city where their lives fell into turmoil. And life became much more complex. No longer did most lives follow the changing of the seasons. They now followed the twists and the turns of the business cycle. We were growing fast, which meant serious growing pains. Immigrants slept in tiny apartments, ten to a room. Families lived with a threat of disease and often death. Banks went bust. Our economy was growing mightily. But there was great pain along the way. And that pain seemed to cry out for somebody to do something. And that somebody, the progressives thought, was the federal government. The progressives thought they were improving on the founders' work. They thought that the Constitution was old and inadequate. People needed more than just natural rights. People needed government-granted rights. Only government could navigate the turns of history. Only government could remove the uncertainty from life. 
in the progressive state, government would build up the most wealth for our country and divvy it up in the fairest way. The progressives saw our federal system as an obstacle. They thought our local communities were parochial and inefficient. Why should people have to rely on their family? Why should they have to work with their neighbors? They believed the attachments of family and neighborhood, like the Constitution, were old and inadequate. Their policies weakened those attachments. In fact, they strengthened one attachment, attachment to the government. Now, the progressives wanted a national community where government stood supreme, tending to the needs of its subjects. Progressivism is well-intentioned, but it is also, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, arrogant and condescending. Instead of helping people make their own decisions, it makes those decisions for them. It makes Washington the center of power and politicians the center of attention. Here's one reason Teddy Roosevelt was a progressive. His daughter once said that he wanted to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. <laughs> but this vision proved compelling. It drew thousands of people into government. The New Dealers, the Whiz Kids, the Poverty Warriors. Confident in their cause, they seized the moral high ground. They said they were the heirs of the founders, when in reality, they were the replacements. They said they were for the people, and their opponents? Well, they were for the rich. They were selfish. When we were debating the health care bill in the House, one Democrat described the Republican position this way. He said, don't get sick, and if you do, die quickly. Funny, I don't seem to remember that part in our substitute bill. <laughs> the progressives hijacked our rhetoric as well. They knew the appeal of our founding principles. They masked their novel ideas in the founders' language and still do. As president, Woodrow Wilson started new federal agencies and created a new income tax. What did he call his agenda? The new freedom. <clears throat> Behind all this talk is the same idea. The same idea behind the health care law. The left thinks they can make health care more rational, and they don't mind stepping on a few toes to do it. The law puts new burdens on doctors. It adds new coverage mandates, including those that violate some people's religious beliefs. So doctors talk of closing their offices, and Catholic bishops are thinking of closing their hospitals. Government is pushing out all those providers who don't agree with it. It's clearing out that space between itself and each person. It's invading deeply personal relationships and, in some cases, ending them. Yet they keep winning elections. Why? Well, you can see the appeal. In uncertain times, people look for security. Progressives seem to have an answer. We may not be leaving the farms anymore, but we are moving into an information-driven economy where change is so rapid. Creative destruction sounds a lot better than it feels. Change dislocates and disrupts. The hardships are real. In the progressive state, it offers a sense of security. But it's a false sense of security. Because government cannot keep all of these promises. We're learning this the hard way. For years, we've talked about big government in theory, now, we're seeing it in practice. Again, look at the health care law. We were told, if you like your insurance plan, you can keep it. But insurance companies are dropping coverage. Companies are dropping their coverage. We were told that if you liked your doctor, you could keep her. But your doctor may not keep you. We were told that premiums will fall, but they're going up dramatically. I believe this health care law will collapse under its own weight but we have to offer something better in its place. This is our opportunity to take back the initiative. And our goal, let me be really clear about this, our goal is not simply to win an election. It's to improve people's lives. <clears throat> Politics is a means to an end. It's not an end in and of itself. And the end is for all people to be able to pursue happiness. So our job is not to make even more empty promises. It's to revive the American idea. 
we had to show that the American idea is superior to the progressive state, both in our time and for all time. We had to show that the American idea offers true security, because unlike the progressive state, it offers true community. Its promise is real. Here's what the left got right. The American idea needs a strong government to secure it. But a government is effective only when it is limited. And a massive government can stifle the American idea. Government can't replace our local communities, and it shouldn't even try. Instead, it should reinforce our communities. Government should expand the space where a free society can thrive. We should expand that space because it's part of the American idea. We want everyone to have a chance in life, a chance to be happy. And you know what? We're happiest when we're together. We want to be together. It's in our nature. We feel it in our bones. Now, Barney Frank once said, government is the name for the things we do together. That's just one name. There are lots of them. The church meeting, the neighborhood watch, the food bank, the small business, the health care clinic, the homeless shelter. We call these things mediating institutions. But in the end, they're just people, people working together. And the more we work together out of our own free will, the stronger we become. The strongest glue isn't fear or force, it's friendship and love. We stick together. <clears throat> We stick together because we share the same beliefs. That's the source of our strength. And when government tries to do too much, when it replaces cooperation with coercion, it weakens our country. It pulls us apart. It deprives people of their purpose. So conservatives, most of all, believe in cooperation because most of all, we believe in freedom. That's something I learned from AEI, from people like Peter Berger, Richard Newhouse, Michael Novak, Bill Shambra. You've preserved and expanded on Robert Nisbet's central insight. People hunger for freedom, for self-fulfillment. And they hunger for a community where they can realize their potential. That's the key to the American idea, and I learned it from you. <clears throat> you know, I also learned it from my mom, Betty. Thanks for the shout out, Becky. <laughs> my dad died when I was 16. It was tough on our family. But my mom went out and she got involved. She took flight. She got ready. She pulled herself up. She got involved in everything. The school board, the local parish, the garden club, the bridge club. Heck, she didn't even know how to play bridge. <laughs> she still doesn't. <laughs> and she made lifelong friends in a group of widows, actually. When a friend in Janesville would lose a husband, Betty would be the first there to comfort. And over time, they formed a group and it began to grow. Out of their losses, they created something new. They formed a community of support. She's just one of many people like her. My hometown, Janesville, Wisconsin, is full of people like this, like a guy named Burdette Erickson. Several years ago, the fourth ward of Janesville was overrun with drug dealers, and they were brazen. They did their deals in the light of day, even on one elderly woman's front porch. She had to close her front drapes for fear of seeing what was happening, and she was worried she would get shot. This is in Janesville, Wisconsin. So Burdette gathered his neighbors in his basement one night, and he and his neighbors, they made a pact with one another. Either the drug dealers go or we go. They formed a neighborhood watch. Their families told the police about the gang deals in their hideouts. And soon, they took their neighborhood back. Now the inmates in our local prison in Janesville, they tell the people coming through, don't do drugs here, don't deal, you'll get busted. And so young families are, move, are moving in and the drug dealers are moving out. <clears throat> our country is full of stories like these, of people banding together to meet a common need. And the most obvious example of this, it's our system of free enterprise. 
You know, as Arthur likes to say, we have to remember free enterprise isn't only the efficient thing to do, it's also the right thing to do because it's a school of character. The voluntary exchange of goods and services brings out the best in us. It builds trust, it teaches discipline, and it rewards hard work. We have to make the moral case for free enterprise. In short, we have to show the full scope of our vision. We have to explain that conservatism is about more than the economy, it's also about our culture. It's about the kind of country we want to be. It's about the kind of life we want to share. We want people to enjoy the journey of living a full life, a life full of trials and tribulations, of loss and gain, and ultimately of the betterment of ourselves, our children, and our communities. Here's our problem. We have failed to communicate this vision to those who have never heard of it. We have retreated to our cultural cul-de-sacs in order to protect our immediate surroundings. Meanwhile, our inner cities, our barrios, our poor rural communities are languishing. This is where our opportunity lies. This is where we must go. This is where we must demonstrate our full vision of freedom and community. <clears throat> this vision is our response to progressivism. It's not as easy to sell, but it's more complete and it's much more real. We have to show how it works and how, in so many cases, today's version of the American idea is right under our noses. You know what? We can start just six miles down the road from here. A few weeks ago, I took a trip to Anacostia with my good friend Bob Woodson. I am a really big fan of Bob Woodson's and a big believer in his Center for Neighborhood Enterprises. He, you see, Bob just doesn't talk about these communities. He talks with these communities. In fact, it is in these very neighborhoods that we see our vision in action. Tonight, I want to sh share a story that I heard just six miles from here. It's about a man named James Woods. James grew up around here. His family wasn't well off. They struggled, but they loved each other. He served 10 years in the military. And after he got out, he met up with some friends from his past. Those friends got him in trouble. They started selling drugs. He became addicted. He was homeless. He slept in the streets. Pretty soon, the law caught up with him. James was charged with selling drugs. The law said 20 years in prison. But a judge gave him a break. He got only three. After James got out of prison, he made a decision. He wanted to be the man that his parents raised him to be he would change. So he joined an all-men's ministry, but he was still struggling. He was still searching. And every night, through that bedroom window, he would hear this singing. It was in the ministry of Pastor Shirley Holloway, right next door. He didn't know Pastor Holloway, but he heard her members praying. He was intrigued. So one day, he went across the street, and he joined the House of Help, the City of Hope. It was a life-changing moment. James became good friends with Pastor Holloway, and she did him a big favor. She paid his legal fees to keep him out of jail. James got a job. He offered to pay her back. But instead of cashing his checks, Pastor Holloway was saving them so that he would ultimately have a nest egg. He was stunned. It wasn't that she saved his money without his knowing. And it wasn't that she gave him a job. It was that she showed him love. James would say that he didn't expect Pastor Holloway's love because she didn't know him. But in a way, she did know James. She knew who he could be. Soon, he turned his life around. At the ministry, he met his future wife, Angela. She followed a path similar to James, and today, they've been married for 13 years. As James would say, Angela loves God now, and because she's his wife, she's always praying. 
He's been clean for 13 years. He now counsels about 60 men at the ministry. He helps the unemployed. He helps the homeless. He helps the addicted. Angela, meanwhile, has a steady job as a security guard. If you asked Pastor Holloway for her secret, she would say her ministry uses two ingredients, faith and love. Her motto is, we don't see the problem, we see the person. Since the ministry started in 1995, they've served over 40,000 people six miles from here struggling with drug abuse. 85% of their members have stayed clean, 85%. The secret, of course, it's the people. In people, we find real security and real love. A welfare check would not have helped James. It might have met his material needs, but only for a time. He had spiritual needs too. Only people and God can address those needs. James, Angela, and Pastor Holloway, they're three great examples. And I'm honored to have them here as my guest tonight. Please join me in recognizing them and thanking them for their inspiration and their witness. When we make policy, we should keep people like James in mind. Our job is not to replace the Pastor Holloways, it's to support them. Yes, the federal government has a role to play, but it's a supporting role, not a leading one. Its job is to give people the resources and the space to thrive. And in this role, we should follow two principles, solidarity and subsidiarity. Solidarity is the belief that we are all in this together, that we share a common purpose, the pursuit of happiness. And public servants should share one goal, the common good. Subsidiarity, it's like federalism. It's the belief that each part of society adds to the whole, and that each part must be free to do its work on its own terms. So government shouldn't assume other people's tasks. It shouldn't make decisions better left with the family or the neighborhood. The people closest to the problem are more likely to solve it because they know the community best. And this is the opposite of progressivism, which believes that Washington knows best. We need to apply these timeless principles to the challenges of the day. You know, that's what we do in the House budget. What's the link here? Yeah. Our budget is known for our, one part of our vision that government can't spend beyond its means. And it's true. The national debt, it hurts our economy. It restricts opportunity. It weighs down our communities. We have to stop spending money we don't have. But that's our policy. It's not our purpose. Our purpose is to reclaim the American idea. And our policies reflect that purpose. We're not just trying to balance the books. We're trying to grow the economy. We're trying to expand that space for society. The welfare state, well, it threatens to close that space. That's why we need to change course. We need to strike a balance between society and government. We need to let each part play its role. We need government to meet its obligations without crowding out the American idea. In short, our purpose is to ensure that if you work hard and play by the rules, you can get ahead. It's to leave our children a country as strong as the one we inherited, and to do that, Government must reinforce the space for society. It must apply the principles of solidarity and subsidiarity. Take Medicare. We need to protect this critical program. We need to maintain solidarity with our seniors. But we also need to strengthen it by harnessing the knowledge of our local communities. We need to harness the power of subsidiarity. Instead of imposing one plan on everyone, we give seniors a choice so they can pick the insurance plan that works best for them. Progressives think people aren't smart enough to make these decisions on their own. They shouldn't be given these options. But look at Medicare's prescription drug benefit. It works like the reform we'd apply to all of Medicare. It comes in consistently under budget, and satisfaction with that program is sky high. We apply the same principles to Medicaid. 
We maintain funding to show solidarity with the poor, and we harness the power of subsidiarity by enlisting the aid of the states. We give state governments more flexibility. We let them tailor their programs to meet their people's needs. And by doing so, we hope to make Medicaid a better program for those who rely on it. But our replacement needs to go further than that. We have to help people who aren't on either program, and that's the majority of the country. The health care law will make things much worse. But even the current health care system needs to be fixed. That is something we all must acknowledge. Today, our tax code provides an open-ended subsidy for an employer's health insurance. It does nothing for people who buy health insurance on their own. The code locks workers to their jobs. It favors the wealthy, and it pushes up costs. Well, we need to help families get and keep their health insurance. We can do that by attaching the tax benefit to the individual. And if they choose a plan that's less expensive than the benefit, then they get a refund. People shouldn't have to lose their insurance if they change jobs. The benefit should travel with the person, not with the job. Here's the big question. Who should decide? We think you should decide, not Washington. Under our plan, the federal government would make a con defined contribution to your health care security. We'd cap the rate of growth of that contribution to eliminate waste, to encourage competition. But we would also give more help to the poor and the sick, less to help to the rich. Support would go to only those who needed it. And under our plan, we would put you in control. Only you know what works best for you and your family. Our reforms should offer people not just the dignity of self-determination, but the comfort of community. Health care Healthcare is a deeply personal issue. When your health care is at stake, you want your doctor to be someone you trust. You want somebody you know, someone who knows you. In Janesville, Jana and I are more likely to see our doctors at the YMCA or at the school play than at the clinic, just as it can and should be. You don't want to be just the next person in a line. You want the doctor to be like family. But the healthcare law is forcing doctors to close their practices. It's taking this relationship out of our hands. And if we reform healthcare the right way, free enterprise can control costs and increase quality without this kind of bullying. Markets aren't bleak tundras where the strong dominate the weak, as progressives all too often imagine. They're pipelines of knowledge. They bring crucial decisions to the family where they belong. And it's not just health care. We have to apply these principles to all the challenges of the day. Defense, energy, education, immigration, taxes. We have to explain how our policies will improve people's lives. The answer is, we will use the power and the resources of the government to give people the room to thrive. We will maintain our partnership our society has had with our government in the past even in this new era of an aging society and a global economy. This, this is a complete vision of conservatism. It's what we are striving for. It's not a vision of petty materialism. It's not one of lonely individuals overseen by a massive government. It's one of moral nourishment, of self-fulfillment, of growth and opportunity. We can't treat politics like a game. We aren't competing for a trophy. We're competing over the country's future. We're trying to determine what kind of people we're going to be. We have to recognize the stakes. We have to get serious. And I believe we will. Winston Churchill once said, the Americans can be counted upon to do the right thing only after they've exhausted all the other possibilities. <laughs> he got it right. Sometimes other people can see us better than we see ourselves. In fact, I think the best description of the American spirit was written by a Frenchman, Alexis de Tocqueville. We remember Tocqueville for his keen study of our culture. We remember his insight that our local communities are schools of freedom. They teach us how to see past our differences. They teach us how to work together. But he also had a sense for politics. He said that the Senate was home to, quote, the celebrities of America that there was hardly a member who hadn't done an illustrious deed. The House, on the other hand, was home to, quote, 
obscure persons. <laughs> Often the eye seeks in vain for a celebrated man within it. It's kind of humbling, you know. <laughs> On a night like this, I'm less eager to stand out and much more eager to join in. To receive the Crystal Award is to join a fellowship of scholars. It's to take part in the community of ideas. You're the people who got me interested in politics, these scholars. They taught me how to take it seriously. So I'm grateful. And I'm grateful for tonight. You're quite the crowd for an evening's company. In your dedication to truth, in your pursuit of justice, you're a great testament to the American idea. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.